Hello and welcome to the Narc Alert, the channel where we look at YouTubers and others to see if they demonstrate any traits that fall within the spectrum of narcissistic personality disorder or NPD. These videos are for fun and entertainment purposes only, strictly my opinion, and remember, please don't send any snark to our possible narcs. So key points to remember, messy fun, and not a diagnosis. Hello, my lovely alerts, and welcome back to the Narc Alert. This video is going to be structured a little bit differently, although our subject absolutely shows traits that fall within the spectrum of narcissistic personality disorder. There is very little footage of him being anywhere close to genuine, so it makes it very hard to look at his behavior. What we will do is look at an overview of the story and include clips that we can find that illustrate the traits that fall within narcissistic personality disorder. Our subject tonight is Keith Raniere and Nexium. We all have some heroes, some people that we enjoy. Some people have great character, some people have great compassion, some people have great charisma, some people, they have a quality where they're just deeply soulful. Nexium is a methodology that allows people to optimize their experience and behavior. Keith Raniere does not look like the kind of person who you would associate as sort of bigger than life. You see him and it's hard to imagine how he could hold a room. But the story that we hear again and again is that he has an ability to make you feel like you're the only person in the room. Keith was very expert at subliminal suggestion, hypnosis, and very, very subtle techniques about psychology, indoctrination, influence, religion, and I think he really perfected this method. He has an ability to listen very intently, and that was one of the strong draws for people who wanted to come to him for their personal development and personal growth. The number of signs and characteristics that go right back to his teenage years and into his early 20s are very much central to what Nexium became. One of his ex-girlfriends said, you know, he had this idea when he was 13 years old, that he was enlightened. He had reached some higher state of being. The image of himself that he continued to espouse as the head of Nexium is not only the idea of his enlightenment, but also that he's a genius. Yeah, you said once it gets you to the source of your genius and the source of your create your insecurity. Mm. How how is the source of your genius the same as the source of your insecurity? Well, it's if you uh, knew everything and could do everything, mm -hmm. then you'd be a very predictable machine. He's created a kind of mythology around himself that he was talking in full sentences at the age of one and could read completely by the age of two. He was also a self-proclaimed piano prodigy and judo champion. The mythology that he's built around himself of being a genius, of being enlightened, was key. A lot of people mentioned that's what attracted them to join his organization, to follow this guy. The other element that goes right back to his 20s is that he has a particular infatuation with multi-level marketing. We've been able to concentrate all this purchasing power, literally hundreds of thousands of buyers, to get a better deal from the sellers. But they're going to at least, at least, at least do this. So what's going to happen on the average with this structure? Perpetuate. It's going to perpetuate, right. It's going to go and go, because on the average this works. We felt People who became affiliates and recommend us to friends should be rewarded, should earn something for their recommendations. Restaurants don't do it, but we do, and we call it word of mouth income. He worked for a while for Amway and seems to have been inspired by what he saw there. So when he created Nexium, that's how the organization was structured, that the members of Nexium went out and recruited other people, and they earned commissions. It was one of the ways the organization could grow. His view of women and his view of sexual relationships with women 
is also a major factor in the whole thing. And there's a really strong misogynistic undertone to Nexium that people are taught that there are inherent differences between men and women, and one of those differences is that men are naturally polyamorous. They need to have multiple partners, and women are naturally monogamous. Going back to his 20s, Keith Raniere already had polyamorous relationships. He had relationships with a number of women who were solely devoted to him and were okay with him having multiple partners. In 1998, over a four-day period, Keith Raniere and Nancy Salzman, who was an expert therapist in the world of linguistic programming, created what is now known as Nexium. Within it, Keith Raniere is the spiritual leader, a resident philosopher, and he's called Vanguard. Nancy Salzman is called Prefect. As the resident philosopher within the organization, he becomes a renunciate, which means he renounces all his connections to material goods. He doesn't own a car. He claimed in one interview he doesn't even know what shirt he's going to wear the next morning as they're donated to him from the community. Nexium DOS was created by a group of women in the organization as a self-empowerment group by women, for women, and everyone was a part of it. The FBI, however, has a different story about what happened. The FBI claim that DOS was created by Keith Raniere, and he set up a kind of pyramid scheme that he was at the top, so he recruited in the system. He recruited six slaves and instructed them to go out and recruit six slaves of their own, and it would branch out that way. And she starts telling me about this thing called DOS. She believed that the other Nexium programs couldn't push me to become truly empowered like DOS could. Allison told me that Keith had no involvement in this. She said it was women mentoring women in a very specialized, deep way. The FBI alleges that he used the system to instruct women within the DAW system to sleep with him. He also used the system to get people within the DAWs to work for free for the organization. The FBI alleges that in Nexium he had 15 to 20 women in his so-called harem who had committed to him for life. They were committed to be with him only, to have sex only with him, and to keep that relationship secret. They were also okay with him having relationships with multiple women. The FBI named Allison Mack as a co-conspirator. She was charged with sex trafficking, conspiracy and racketeering conspiracy, amongst a number of other charges. She was implicated in the creation and the running of DOS. The FBI allegation is that Allison Mack is the co-conspirator on this project and that she was one of Keith Raniere's personal slaves. They also allege that she herself recruited other slaves to be part of DOS. For Janice, I think, is the most gratifying thing that I've ever done. Um, it's the most challenging thing I've ever done because it consists of working with a group of people in a way that is totally interdependent, meaning um, we're all working together and no one is ever punished and no one is ever um, told that they're wrong or they're bad. And This next question is awesome. It's, if happiness was the national currency, what would make you rich? And I think the answer to that question is uh, bringing together the people that I love the most in order to have a good experience somewhere doing something. I love like putting together dinner parties. I love going traveling to, with people. I love organizing spaces and experiences with the people that I care for the most that cultivate um, good relationships. So when I first came into Jeunesse, I had just come out of a relationship and I was feeling very scared and lost and confused and like, oh my gosh, am I going to be single forever? Am I ever going to be able to have a relationship? What's wrong with me? <laughs> like, ah, all this stuff. And uh, very shortly into the, the program, I started to recognize and experience 
that what I was looking for wasn't about a relationship. What I was looking for was about an experience of myself in my life. So before Jeunesse, I had tons of people around me all the time. I've always been a people person. People used to come visit me in my house and say they were going to Camp Allison because it was like, it was a party. Everywhere I went, it was a party. Um, but I felt very lonely. The format that the Jeunesse Tracks offers with the men and the women and then this consolidated, very intense structure where you are just diving into yourself and understanding how you relate to other people helped me to reveal all of these areas of insecurity, areas of just really basic confusion. And there are allegations that some of these women within the system were instructed by their masters to seduce Keith or to have sex with him. Many of the women were compliant because Nexium held secrets on them and threatened to blackmail them. There came a point where we didn't even know what to submit as collateral anymore. So Allison or the higher ranking members of DOS would just tell us to just make shit up and send it. For instance, you might have to make a video accusing your father of molesting you, even if it wasn't real. It was often worse because it could be even more damaging than the things that you said that were real. Whenever they showed hesitation, there was threats of exposure. The most horrific of the ceremonies these women were made to endure was the branding ceremony. I was the first woman in my group of slaves to be branded. The smell that came from the cauterizing pen burning my flesh was so intense that it filled up the entire townhouse. It was torture, but I still went through with it. I think even worse than the pain was finding out what was really, what the brand really was. What was the brand? Well, ultimately we found out that the brand was Keith Raniere's initials, but um, for a very long time we were told that it was a symbol of the elements, and that was another major lie that was told from the top down. Allison Mack said that she took full responsibility for coming up with the brand's design. She told the women, it was better than a tattoo. People get drunk and tattooed on their ankle, BFF, or a tramp stamp. I have two tattoos, and they mean nothing, she said. Allison Mack told the women to take pride in doing something, quote, more meaningful, something that took guts, end quote. Allison Mack also said the women were told to shout, badass warrior bitches, let's get strong together as a way of pushing through the pain of being branded with Keith Raniere's initials using a cauterizing pen. During the videotaped branding ceremonies, slaves were required to be fully naked, and the master would order one slave to film the entire ordeal, while the other slave held down the person being branded. And at that point, for the first time, Lauren showed us her brand. It's not a tattoo. And I just was really freaked out. It's a fucking medical procedure without anesthetic. And the first person lay down on the table, and they started to draw a line in her flesh with a cauterizing iron. And her flesh started to burn and smoke and sizzle. We had to hold her down. We were crying. We were shaking. We were holding each other. One of my other sisters and I were looking at each other like, what the fuck? Like, where the fuck are we? How did we get here? What kind of person would need the constant validation that Keith Raniere built for himself within Nexium? The way it manifests itself is that in every single scene or workshop you take, there's a photo of Keith Raniere on the wall, and part of the course is that you think about Keith Raniere. And then every year there's a 12-day celebration for his birthday, where people get up on stage and perform for him, and wish him happy birthday and thank him. In fact, there is a huge element of Nexium that is all about paying tribute. This idea of paying tribute and honoring people for the work they've done. But most of it is oriented towards thanking Keith Raniere. It's an interesting question. What's going on with someone that they need that amount of constant validation? 
Let's take a look at a few clips of Keith Raniere and Allison Mack. Okay, so the first question I wanted to ask is something. Thank you, you have your thank list. Thank you, by the way. I do you have, have your list, list of thank questions. You so oh, my. It was funny when I sat down yesterday to write out my questions. I was like, wow, I have a lot of questions for you. Even though I've been your student for years and I get to spend all this time with you, I feel like there's always such a wealth that I can. But when you have the opportunity to put a bright light on me and just question. Me, <laughs> yeah, exactly. What the hey? Keith is exceptional, special, and so much wiser than us. He knows how honored she is to talk to him like this. I have to take advantage. Um, so the first question I came up with is something that sort of, it seems like it's kind of a trend right now. Like mm -hmm. Elizabeth Gilbert started it before with the TED Talk about creativity. And then there's like all these books and all these processes of like, what is creativity? And it's this gift from the gods. And I know for myself, there are moments in time when I feel like mm -hmm. creatively abound. And then there are other times when I just feel like, the most boring person on the planet. I can't come up with anything. Mm. And I was just wondering if you could explain sort of your take on the nature of creativity and... Alison Mack is an actor. She had a role in a show called Smallville. She asks very pointed questions about creativity and he responds with so much word salad. If there's a process of I gotta say a bunch it? of things that are just not creating creativity. Creating creativity. There's a creative yeah. or act. Or is it like a muscle that you or can Or a scientific build? act. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. I, I normally speak of science and creativity as sort of being somewhat opposite, but they're, they're not real. I mean, inherent in science is this notion that we can have free will, and there's even in science things like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that, that talks about our limits on how we can observe things. and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, a point is, if we have something that we can predict, it becomes not creative at all, it has no free will, and it's science. And if it seems to have free will, we see it as things, and things parts of it that are not predictable and thereby creative. It creates. It is the thing that comes from it is not a function of that which comes before mm -hmm. in any way that we can predict. It's as if this thing birthed something totally new and unpredictable. Mm -hmm. The only thing worse than his pompous word salad is Alison Mack fawning over every word out of his mouth. This is a narcissist with a full tank of fuel. Yeah, if it's predictable, it's not creative. Right. <clears throat> so, of course, we as humans feel we have free will, and that's sort of interesting, but it doesn't mean we do. <clears throat> you know, so for example, if someone's just being lazy, then people think it's creative. So then if that's the, <laughs> if that's the nature of creativity, is there some way that you can practice the muscle so it doesn't feel so reactive and still not pre-programmed, <laughs> but it's something that you can slip into easily or something that you can access at will or... Something like that. When, well, when she speaks to him, even when she's making a statement, she has a questioned look on her face, almost as if she is afraid to form her own opinion. When you say that, you're asking more for applied creativity. Hmm. So what you want to do is channel it into something that's socially acceptable and, and labeled as creativity. I guess so, or maybe just the root of uh, something that you produce. I mean, how do you know you're being creative? I, mean, I produce a bunch of curriculum. I have no idea if that's creative. She seems to be seeking some validation of her creativity. She's an actor on a network TV show. He consistently, subtly puts her down by creating a narrative where creativity is nothing special. Yeah, well, I mean, it feels it's useful. Like, <laughs> I think creativity, to me, like it has to do with generating something that hasn't existed before to share a feeling, share an experience. Like it has to do with, I mean, art. It's just like expression. That. Okay. But then there's expression that's very rote and very like controlled and very formulaic that you see over and over. And then there's expression that's like very new or profound or effective, innovative, you could even say. So. To me, there's different levels of creativity in that. Another statement of her feelings framed as a question as she tries to defend her creativity. Well, you know, it's interesting. Do you think the best actors are the most creative? I think they're the most authentic. 
Right. So this, maybe not. So, I, I, I mean, when I would ask, what's the use of being able to label what you do as creativity or someone's being creative? Interesting. I don't know. I think I just like, I have a, an interest and I think it's co pretty common. Um, I guess it has more to do with just like generating work that's relatable, mm -hmm. but generating, I guess, work, like something original, something that's... Well, interesting and compelling. Yeah. Well, that's the, the thing. You see, creativity somehow imports with it these positives of interesting and, mm -hmm. um, you know, new and surprising mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, you know, all sorts of fireworks and flowers and butterflies. and. Yeah. Another subtle put-down by the vanguard. He is telling her she only wants to be considered creative because she sees it as a special quality. She looks pained. Only he is truly special. Wow. But, see, <laughs> creative. Yeah. But, you know, the opposite of creative, if you look at it as either rote or scientific or, or method, methodological or whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. um, that almost becomes pejorative. That person's not creative. Hmm. Oh, well, then what are they? Well, they're boring. Right. No fun. You know what, Keith? We think you are no fun, and that's putting it mildly. On June 19th in 2019, the jury found Rainier guilty on all charges after five hours of deliberation. He was found guilty of sexual exploitation of a child, sex trafficking, identity theft, trafficking for labor and services, conspiracy to alter records for use in an official proceeding, and sex trafficking conspiracy, forced labor conspiracy, racketeering conspiracy, and wire fraud conspiracy. In October 2020, Rainier was sentenced to 120 years in prison and fined $1.75 million. Just before her sentencing, Allison Mack released a statement. She said her involvement with Nexium was the biggest mistake and the greatest regret of her life. She expressed a great deal of remorse. In addition to the letter, her attorneys asked for no jail time because her remorse and cooperation helped with Rainier's prosecution. In June 2021, Allison Mack was sentenced to three years in prison and three years of probation. She must complete 1,000 hours of community service and pay a fine of $20,000. So there you have it, our look at Keith Rainier, Allison Mack, and the Nexium cult. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to click like if you like. We'd love it if you'd support the channel. We've got very low-priced memberships on YouTube. And if you want more Narc Alert, please consider joining our Patreon. Thank you so much for listening. Until we meet again, be kind and hasta luego.